Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to um, the Leo Beck Institute Book Club. And I am Michael Simonson, the Director of Public Outreach here at the Leo Beck Institute. For anyone who is new to our group, welcome. Um, we're gonna discuss the trial today. And um, it's a very exciting time to return to the trial and to Kafka because this is um, the, the hundred year anniversary of his death. There are many things already going on uh, related to Kafka and his work um, here in New York, but also all around the world. Uh, and in fact, on May 21st, we're going to have a uh, event here. It's gonna be our annual uh, memorial lecture, but it's um, only gonna be live, though it usually is then after that recorded and put on our social media. Um, and it's going to be, it's uh, the event is called, the speech lecture is called Still Reading Kafka on Language, Literature, Friendship and Identity. Um, and it is going to be given by Hillel Kival, who is Gloria M. Goldstein Professor of Jewish History and Thought at Washington University in St. Louis. And she's going to look with a particularly Jewish lens on the work of Kafka. We're going to do some of that today, too. Now, I wanted to um, first introduce our guest. I'm excited to have her today, Vivian Liska. She is a professor of German literature and director of the Institute of Jewish Studies at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. She is also a distinguished visiting professor in the Faculty of the Humanities at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She has been visiting professor at numerous universities, most recently at Yale in the fall of 2022, and she's published extensively on literary theory, German modernism, and German Jewish authors and thinkers. Uh, she is the editor of the book series, Perspectives on Jewish Texts and Contexts, published out of Berlin, and co-editor of the yearbook of the Society of European Jewish Literature and of Arcadia International Journal of Literary Studies. I'll just say some of her works, which are many, so I'm not going to read that. It'd be, it'd be impossible to read them all. Uh, Contemporary Jewish Writing in Europe, A Guide, 2007. Theodore Herzl, Between Europe and Zion, 2007. What Does the Veil Know, 2009. Kafka and Universalism, 2016. Sartre, Jews, and the Other, 2020. That is only some of, of, of what she's written. Uh, so I am going to start now um, in our usual way. We're going to turn it over to uh, Professor Liska. Uh, she is going to present on the trial. Uh, her presentation will run maybe a little longer than it usually does for us, about half an hour. Um, but I think everyone will find it very interesting and well worth it. So welcome, everyone, and welcome, Professor Liska. And you can uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for inviting me to speak here, to speak about Kafka's The Trial, and thank you for this introduction. So I am delighted indeed uh, to uh, be invited to speak about uh, such a monumental work of the 20th century. Franz Kafka's The Trial is indeed one of the most famous and emblematic literary works of the 20th century. The novel, which is widely associated with an atmosphere of inescapable oppression, is considered as the most powerful literary embodiment of the individual's experience of alienation and disorientation in the early 20th century. At its core, the trial is a haunting confrontation of modern man with powers that are both realistic and uncanny both omnipresent and inaccessible. Interpretations of the nature of these powers cover the entire spectrum of human experience. They range from the historical to the political, sociological, psychological, and metaphysical realm, both in the philosophical and the religious sense. How come that an obscure and fragmentary novel by a young Jewish author from Prague who was barely known in his lifetime and who left behind a rather slim oeuvre has gained this status. 
Reading Kafka, like other modernist writers, such as Samuel Beckett or James Joyce, can be a bewildering, maybe even disturbing experience. Impossible events occur with an air of inevitability and even self-evidence. The protagonist of one of Kafka's stories wakes up as an insect without understanding why and how. In another work, the main character believes to have been summoned by the castle in a village, yet never reaches this castle and doesn't understand what went wrong. In the trial, the bank employee, Joseph K., is arrested one morning in his bedroom and doesn't ever find out the reason for this arrest, nor does he come to understand the nature of the court that issued this arrest. In all these cases, neither the fictional figure nor the reader is given any explanation for these events and this to the very end. Why does Kafka disorient us in this way? A common explanation pertaining to modern art in general is that of the, as of the early 20th century, art no longer presents itself to a passive audience or readership, but invites these to participate in making sense of the work in front of them. Another reason more specific, though not exclusive to Kafka, lies in the intention to confront us with something foreign and strange that is never resolved and to thereby deeply unsettle our common assumptions, existential habits, and modes of perception. To pull away the ground under our feet, to make us aware of, in Kafka's own words, our self-deception that, and I'm quoting, we are sleeping in stable houses, in solid beds, under a sheltering roof. The sense of exposure and vulnerability that ensues allows us a glimpse into what lies below, above, or next to our world as we are accustomed to it, or rather to lead us to a confrontation with how we relate to this unknown, unknowable other of our habitual world. And it's both frightening and glorious magnitude, which is most often lulled by our false sense of stability that we establish within the sheltering confines of our civilization and culture. Arguably, the importance of Kafka, whose fame has only kept growing, is due to the fact that his work unfolds at the threshold between our everyday life, its personal, social, political, and historical dimensions on the one hand, and a metaphysical realm of the numinous, the sublime, or the divine on the other. Kafka also situates himself at a threshold between the old and the new world. Kafka writes himself, I am the end or the beginning. At this threshold, Kafka confronts us and confronts what is since Friedrich Nietzsche called the death of God in ways that retain a sense of the huge dimension of what got lost. The immensity of the castle that dominates the village yet cannot be reached. The ubiquity of the court that can neither be found nor escaped. The glory of an all powerful emperor who before dying leaves a legacy in the form of a personal message to his renegade subject I'm referring to the story, an imperial message here. So a, a personal message to his renegade subject, modern man, a message that never reaches him. And when I say modern man, I of course mean men and women and everything else. The trial is the epitome of this experience. The plot of the trial is both complex and unforgettable. A man is accused of a crime he appears not to have any recollection of having committed and whose nature is never revealed to him. In what may ultimately be described as a tragic quest narrative, the protagonist's search for truth and clarity about himself, his alleged guilt, and the system he's facing leads to 
increasing confusion before ending with his execution in an abandoned quarry. For all its fundamental strangeness, the novel seems to address defining concerns of modern times, a sense of radical estrangement, the powerlessness of the individual in a bureaucratically controlled society, perhaps the rise of totalitarianism, as well as, and to some extent, in tension with these more tangible aspects, the frightening meaninglessness of a world apparently abandoned by God. The novel has indeed mainly been read in these two ways, either as a social and political critique of power and modernity, in which the individual, the everyman, Joseph K., is crushed by an anonymous evil authority. But if this were all, the novel would be nothing more than an Orwellian dark horror story, or, as has often been claimed, a prophetic vision of the Third Reich that arrests innocent people without explanation and executes them in cold blood. That the novel reaches beyond this reading as a social critique is palpable in glimpses of uncanny elements. But it is mainly due to a crucial element of the novel, the only part of it that Kafka published in his lifetime, and his diary contains what for Kafka is a rare admission that he experienced after writing this particular part, and I quote, a feeling of satisfaction and happiness regarding the legend of the doorkeeper. And that would become one of the most interpreted and discussed texts in the whole of 20th century German literature and beyond. The text before the law. And this is what I will concentrate on in the rest of my presentation. Before the law stands a doorkeeper. Um, could you please bring on the text so that uh, uh, people can read it alongside my reading of the text. Sure, not a problem. Thank you. Before the law stands a doorkeeper. A man from the country comes to this doorkeeper and asks for admission to the law. But the doorkeeper says that he cannot grant him admission now. The man reflects and then asks if he will therefore be permitted to you enter. You know, Vivian, just one second. Yes. I think we we only have the PowerPoint. We don't have the other text. You can go down the PowerPoint. All the way down? Okay. Almost. Just go down, you'll find it. Down, down, down. Okay. If you Hold don't, on, I'll tell I can you when it it's. Screen. Why don't you just continue where you are and we'll catch up to you? No, I can wait a minute. Yeah, maybe. Okay. We'll just wait a second then. Otherwise, I can put it on. It's not at the screen. end of the PowerPoint. It's not at the end of the PowerPoint, I'm afraid. Not all the way. So let me share it. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. No problem. You just have to wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. We can we can do that. You see it now? Yes, we see it now. Okay. And it's in the book too, if everyone has their copy. I mean, it'll be on different pages. I won't go into that, but I'm sure many of you out there have, have your books at hand. It's this a good is book a club new numbers. translation. Um, it just has small differences from another one. So Sure. Okay, go ahead. Before the law stands a doorkeeper. A man from the country comes to this doorkeeper and asks for admission to the law. But the doorkeeper says that he cannot grant him admission now. The man reflects and then asks if he will therefore be permitted to enter later. It is possible, the doorkeeper says, but not now. Since the gate to the law is open as always, 
and the doorkeeper steps aside. The man bends down to look through the gate into the interior. When the doorkeeper notices this, he laughs and says, if you find it so tempting, then try to enter despite my prohibition. But take note, I am powerful and I'm only the lowest doorkeeper from room to room. However, stands doorkeeper, stand doorkeepers, each one more powerful than the last. The mere sight of the third is more than even I can bear. The man from the country had not expected such difficulties. The law is, after all, meant to be accessible to everybody at all times, he thinks. But now, as he looks more closely at the doorkeeper in his fur coat, his large pointed nose and his long, thin, black, tight beard, he decides that he would actually prefer to wait until he receives permission to enter. The doorkeeper gives him a stool and lets him sit to the side of the door. He sits there for days and for years. He makes many attempts to gain admission and tires the doorkeeper with his pleading. The doorkeeper often subjects him to little questioning, asks him about his homeland and much else besides. But these are indifferent questions like those posed by great gentlemen. And in the end, he always tells him that he cannot admit him yet. The man who equipped himself with many items for his journey, uses everything, no matter how valuable it is, to bribe the doorkeeper. The letter does indeed accept everything, but also adds, I'm accepting it only so you don't think that you neglected something. Throughout those many years, the man observes the doorkeeper almost continuously. He forgets the other doorkeepers, and this first one seems to him to be the only obstacle to his being admitted to the law. He curses this unlucky coincidence recklessly and loudly in the early years and later as he grows old, simply mutters to himself. He becomes childish. And since he has, during his long years studying the doorkeeper, spotted the fleas in his fur collar, he asks even the fleas to help him change the doorkeeper's mind. Finally, his eyesight weakens and he does not know whether it is really getting darker around him or whether his eyes are merrily deceiving him. Yet he now perceives amidst the darkness a radiance which bursts out inextinguishably from the door of the law. He does not live much longer. Before he dies, all the experiences of the whole time come together in his mind as a question that he has not yet asked the doorkeeper. <clears throat> he beckons to him, for he can no longer straighten his stiffening body. The doorkeeper has to bend down low to him, for the difference in height has greatly changed to the disadvantage of the man. So now, what else do you want to know, the doorkeeper asks? You are insatiable. But everyone strives toward the law, the man said. How is it that during those many years, no one except for me requested admission? The doorkeeper realizes that the man is nearing his end, and in order to reach his diminished hearing, he roars at him. Nobody else could be admitted here since this entrance was intended for you alone. I shall now go, I shall go now and close it. So let me sum this up, but I will stop sharing the screen. Kafka's parable describes a scene in which a man seeks access to the law, is denied entry to it, and waits at its door until the end of his life when the doorkeeper tells him, who has just seen a shimmer of light emanating from the door, that this entrance to the law was meant for him alone and that the doorkeeper will now close it. So here it is in a nutshell in one sentence. The main body of the parable consists of a description of the negotiations of the man with the doorkeeper as he strives to gain access to the law. The text raises many questions. What is the law? What is behind the door? Why does the man want to go there? Why is it both open and inaccessible? What are the alternatives, if any, for the man? Who is the doorkeeper? What does the expression, you are insatiable, mean here? 
Why was it meant only for him? The parable points to the metaphysical dimension of the novel itself. Possibly we, the readers, are like the man from the country who cannot enter its ultimate meaning, its truth, and all we can do is speculate in front of it. Numerous readings exist, and I will sum up some of them before coming to my own interpretation. So numerous readings exist from the most widespread to the most outlandish. The first and most common reading sees the parable as a concentrated account of Joseph Kay's fate in the novel. The man from the country would then be Kay himself. This reading suggests that Joseph Kay's error lies in his failure to see the real significance that is revealed in the parable. It pictures the futility of all efforts. From this perspective, Kafka's parable turns out to be an effective manner of conveying an all-embracing and total futility. But then one wonders if this is what the parable is all about, about this total futility of reaching the truth. Isn't there some kind of paradox in claiming this futility as a truth statement? Well, in any case, if this is what the parable is about, it comes too late for the man from the country and for Joseph K, whose whole search is in vain anyway. Maybe it is a lesson for us, a very bleak one. Don't even try to reach the law, the meaning of it all, or the truth. Or, as some students have suggested in the past when I taught this, why is he sitting there all together? Why doesn't he just walk away and get a life? Not so for another, somewhat rarer kind of reading, though this one too sees the parable as a lesson. From this other perspective, the parable teaches something else entirely. The man should never have abandoned the idea that the law is accessible to everyone at all times. He should have rebelled, rebelled against the doorkeeper. In a word, he should have entered in defiance of all the discouragements. It is those entitled to admittance, it is though only those entitled to admittance establish their right by proceeding through the door despite the doorkeeper's warning. The figure of the doorkeeper, according to this interpretation, appears as a symbol of all those powers which barred man to a life of independence and personal responsibility. And it was the man's cowardice and fear that endowed the doorkeeper with the power to deny him access. He didn't try, and this is his failure. The lesson intended for the reader, be brave and go in. So we had already three possibilities. The one, it is futile and there's no other possibility. The other is to go in. And then there was the one of my students to just walk away. And here's another one, a rare one and recent one, developed by the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben. It is what I call a Christian anarchist reading. In this reading, the parable is the epitome of a paralyzed situation of a kind of ban in which the man from the country, but also Joseph K, is held, held by the powers. These powers are set up in the image of a kind of sovereign, whether a political or a divine sovereign, and Paulus, the Apostle Paulus, who suspends or undoes the law because it turns us all into sinners, becomes the model of undoing the law. And the interpretation here 
is that the key moment of the whole parable is not this failure of the man who enters to, to enter the law, but the key moment is that finally he somehow gets the doorkeeper to slam the door shut. And the law, which is in this interpretation seen as absolutely oppressive, the moment of this door getting shut becomes a moment of redemption and a moment of salvation for humanity. I now come to my own reading of the parable. In my reading, before the law is not a microcosm of the trial, nor is it a lesson, but it is a hidden counter parable to the novel, a possibility to view life differently. Now, there are obviously similarities between the novel and the parable. The protagonist doesn't have access to the truth or the law. Both die at the end. But in the novel, the protagonist is executed. In the parable, the man from the country dies of a natural death after a long life and after having seen a shimmer of light. The major difference is that in the novel, it is all a question of failure or rather guilt, a guilt that is not resolved. Is Joseph K. guilty or not? What is his guilt? Why isn't he aware of it? Are all humans guilty? Is death the punishment of some kind of original sin? Or is it just the law dictating a dismal human condition? But in the parable, there is arguably no question of guilt and not even necessarily the depiction of a failure. The door or the gate and the doorkeeper are the threshold to another world. Before the law is indeed a threshold story between this world and the numinous, the truth, the absolute, the divine. The man from the country wants to have access to the truth, the other side of the worldly, the otherworldly, the numinous, and the priest speaks from the threshold to that other side. And what he is saying can be interpreted as a kind of wisdom about life. We all want to figure out what is behind it all, spending a life at that threshold with a sense that there is something huge behind there that we don't have access to, can take the shape of the life of the man from the country, his negotiations of the man with the doorkeeper, the begging, the bribing, the questioning. So maybe his is not even a failed life, but a life in expectation, in hope and despair, in the proximity of truth with, at the end, a glimpse of light. Maybe this is just life from a metaphysical perspective. It is individual and different for each one. In this case, the parable tells Joseph K that he got wrongly entangled in a discourse on guilt and punishment, of feeling persecuted and reclaiming justice. Maybe as in the book of Job, the man from the country is wrangling with God who then replies from the whirlwind, but without giving Job the final answer about the last things. Nevertheless, Job's laments are not futile. They are his address to God, his poetry, the poetry of human life, when lived close to, yet not from within, these ultimate things. Baita Benjamin compares Kafka stories to the Talmud. And I'm quoting, we may remind ourselves here, and he means with Kafka, of the form of the Haggadah, the name Jews have given to the rabbinical stories and anecdotes that serve to explicate and confirm the teaching, the halacha. And Benjamin continues, Kafka's writings do not modestly lie at the feet of the doctrine, as the Haggadah lies at the feet of the halacha. Though apparently reduced to submission, they unexpectedly raise a mighty paw against it. So Benjamin says, in many ways, Kafka stories resemble the Agadah in the Talmud, so this narrative uh, dimension of the Talmud, 
But Benjamin says that there is this big difference that in the Kafka's case, they raise a mighty paw against the halakha, against the law. Now, Benjamin is somewhat wrong about the way the Agadah in the Talmud functions. Because even there, these narrative elements can have very different meanings and very different ways of interacting with the legal aspect in the Talmud. They, they can either support the law or they can expand the reach of the law, but there is also one way in which they can subvert or push against the law or question it. And I believe that what Walter Benjamin has in mind here in terms of this mighty paw in Kafka is already present often in the Talmud itself. So now let's, to end, read the parable from this point of view. Before the law stands, so we have the, this confrontation between the Alakha and the Agadah, and uh, I will try to read the law and the man from the country in terms of such a confrontation. Before the law stands a doorkeeper, to this doorkeeper comes a man. These first words of the parable evoke an archetypal narrative situation. In the juxtaposition of the verb stands with the verb comes, something static and stable is confronted with the onset of an event, a potential encounter, something comes. This narrative situation occurs in the context of the law, which is generally regarded as in conflict with narrative. The law, a general codified and impersonal entity, clashes with the singularity, temporality, the concreteness and situatedness of a particular individual's lived life, which inevitably involves a narrative. What is it then that happens when this man comes to the law? The law designates this immutable entity in contrast to the man who has an origin, a history, and a destiny. The man, we are told, comes from the country from a concrete place associated with simple life to a place endowed with an ominous aura. We get to know that the man left his homeland and set out on a journey that he has a purpose, access to the law, and arrives at its gate where he waits, searches, reflects, discusses, and negotiates, desires and curses before growing old and dying, presumably without having attained his goal. But is this really so? That the man from the country is, as many before me have noticed, a translation of the Hebrew word am ha'aretz, literally a man from the land, so a man from the country, but also the designation of one who is ignorant of the law, underlines his creaturely nature. Beyond suggesting that the Am Haaretz is outside the law because of his ignorance, he is also implicitly put in opposition to a Talmud Chacham, a student or scholar of the law. However, it remains to be seen whether the Am Haaretz, the one ignorant of the law, the man from the country, were he to turn into a true student of the law, would have fulfilled his wish to enter through its door. The doorkeeper, both mediator and obstacle to the encounter, is described as the lowest representative of the law. He may also be a kind of legal or rabbinic authority who marks the threshold, the separation, but also the link between the law that is said to be immutably there and the man who has a story, a minimal one, but nevertheless a story. Maybe it takes an Amha'aretz, a man ignorant of the law, to want to actually access the law. One who doesn't know at first that it is not to be entered, that negotiating with its representatives, the rabbinic authorities, is, in the Talmudic tradition, the very encounter with the law itself. 
were he to be a Talmud Chacham, a scholar of the law, he would know the Talmudic saying, Tzedek, Tzedek Tirdof, justice, strive for it. Justice is to be striven for, but it is implied in this saying that it cannot be fully attained and fulfilled. Now, in the Christian tradition, Christ took care of this. He fulfilled the law once and for all. The man from the country and we, its readers, get to see that the door to the law is open, but that it is not about entering, about fulfilling it. But probably it takes an Amaharetz, like the man from the country, to want to approach the law to bring the human, creaturely, narrative, maybe literary element of the Agadah to the Alaha in order to point at its limits, not by suspending or abrogating it, but by marking the necessary interaction between law and narrative, which is itself the notion of justice upheld in the Talmud. Kafka himself brings the Haggadah of his stories to the Halakha, the experiential human dimension to the law. It is only in their togetherness that the law can be meant for this single man alone. When the man from the country, the singular existence dies, the door to the law also closes. Benjamin's mighty paw points at three things. The, why is it a paw? It's the creaturely dimension. Second, there is a kind of warning against overpo overpowering the human creature so that law may overpower the human creature. And three, it is a gesture of a limitation. It is said in Midrash Bereshit Rabbah, if it is a world you want, then strict justice is impossible. And if it is strict justice you want, then a world is impossible. The absolute claim to justice expected from the law thus has to be limited by the man from the country, by his narrative, maybe by literature, because these provide the necessary human dimension that makes the law capable of reckoning with lived life. And to end, one of the rare diary entries by Franz Kafka that mentions the Talmud goes as follows. When a scholar sets out to look for a bride, he should take with him an Amoretz, the Yiddish expression for Amaretz in its German form. Because, Kafka's quote continues, too engulfed in his studying, the scholar would not see what is necessary. As with the Agadah joined with Alakha, the man from the country is the necessary companion of the Talmud Chacham. He is the necessary dialogue partner of the doorkeeper of the law. Only together and in dialogue do they reveal das Notwendige, that which is necessary for life and which Joseph K. did not find. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. That was really, really excellent and very, very interesting. And